Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Ali Nakvi. I'm the head of equities for Asia Pacific at Credit Suisse. It's my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the 2012 Asian Investment Conference. And also to thank you for making this conference such a big milestone for anyone who is looking at Asia as an investment destination. It's also great to see a lot of familiar faces this morning who have been regular participants to this conference, and I also want to extend a special welcome to those who are attending the AIC for the first time. I and the entire Credit Suisse team do hope that over the next week or so to meet all of you, either at the conference or many of the thematic dinners and events we are hosting throughout this week in the evenings. This morning is the start of what we believe will be the best AIC in its 15-year history. I can say with some confidence because I've been here for 14 years or out of the 15 years of AIC. Uh, I think and hope that you'll see that over the next five days. Uh, just to give you some stats, we have over 2,000 institutional investors and high net worth individuals. Uh, despite that, we closed the registration one month in advance. We have over 600 corporate representatives, including up close to 200 CEOs and CFOs. And we have over 50 high-profile speakers, including three former heads of state, two prime ministers, uh, a president, four current central bank governors, sitting ministers, government regulators, and independent thought leaders. Now I would like to hand over to my colleague, Pamela Thomas-Graham, to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Zhu Min. Pamela is the Chief Talent Branding and Communication Officer at Credit Suisse. She is a member of the Global Executive Board, and she's here at the AIC with the rest of the entire Executive Board. Uh, please welcome Pamela. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, and welcome to all of you. On behalf of Credit Suisse and its Executive Board, I'd like to extend my personal thanks to all of you for joining us uh, for this annual event. We think it'll be extremely interesting and stimulating, and we look forward to a really terrific series of conversations and discussions over the next few days. It's an honor and a privilege for me now to be able to introduce you to our very first keynote speaker of the event, Dr. Zhu Min, the Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Zhu will talk to us today about the challenges for governments and the world economy in 2012. As we all know, last year was marked by fundamental shifts in the global economic and political arena, and clearly these events have not run their course. They'll continue to be a key consideration for investors this year. They will affect the global economy, and they're clearly presenting the Inter International Monetary Fund with unpre unprecedented challenges. The fund's recent call on its members to provide extra resources for up to one trillion US dollars for bailout loans over the next two years reflects the scale of these challenges. In view of the many forces shaping the world economy, we're delighted to welcome one of the world's most senior economic policymakers to the Asia Investor Conference. As a former deputy governor of the People's Bank of China and group executive vice president of the Bank of China, Dr. Zhu draws on deep policymaking and financial industry experience. And I'm sure that he will offer us an insightful appraisal of the continuing rebalancing of the economic world, the challenges faced by many governments, and the growing role of Asia in the global economy and our financial system. It's an honor to have you here with us today, Dr. Zhu. Please come forward and please thank all of you for coming and welcoming Dr. Zhu to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Pamela, for the very kind words of uh, introduction. Thanks for the invitation from Credit Suisse. It's a great honor to be here to speak to this very distinguished audience. And, uh, and particularly, welcome all of you come to here. It's a very early, uh, foggy Monday morning. I understand how difficult it is for you guys to get up in the early after a beautiful, sunshiny Sunday. So, thanks for coming. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, the global economic situations, and uh, 
I will do a few things. Uh, first of all, I will uh, give you my views about assessments about current global economic situation. Then I will go through the few things I think that really the trend is really uh, changing and shaping the global uh, structure, economic and financially, at the current moments. The three issues I would like to mention is number one, the deleveraging process, number two, the excess liquidity, and number three, the ever enhanced global interconnectedness. Um, I can talk a few other things, Asia and so whatever, but I probably I guess I will stop here. So I'll uh, open the floor for the Q&As. I think that for the current global economic situation, I would say three things. Number one, the global growth rate is slowing down. Number two, the things are getting better. Number three, the risks are still on downsides. We forecast the global economic growth rate is three and a quarter for this year. So it's a lower compared with the 4% that we forecast for last year. Because we use the PPT, PPP measures, if you use a market rate, the rate can be much lower. You see the number from investment houses, their cross varies. But things are looking much better in the first two quarters. In Europe, because the central bank provides the liquidity into the systems, and it really helps to ease the constraints on the liquidity and on the credit side. And we see the stock market getting back, uh, roughly the August last year level. We observe the bonds year also drops to the very much August last year level. And after particularly, it's a great bonds swap deal. And we see the markets much more stabilized. The confidence is getting back. I think it really looks better now because before that, the real concern is if there's a credit constraints, if there's a speeded deleveraging process, the credit tide can really drop the European GDP growth slowing. So I would say at this moment, with all the policies in the field, we avoid a very much credit constraints, which is good news. In the US, if you're looking for the data, it looks even better. In the past 23 weeks, every week, the US will be able to put 200 some thousand jobs into the systems. In the first time in the past few weeks, the payroll growth rates succeed the job growth rates. That's the first time. In the past three years, the first time, this has really helped the aggregate demand in the US side. Consumer confidence is back. And the car sale really is going up, up to 15 million now. So it's a lot of the good data follow up, plus corporate investments on equipment and the IT and a few others. In the emerging market, the growth is still strong, but actually weak than we expected. The reason emerging market in the past two months the growth is weakened because all these economists in the region really take the production policy to against a perceivable, a difficulty challenging economy. So they are trying to cool down the economy, tight, fighting with the inflation pressures and with the local various issues. So it's, it's a slowdown, but slowdown very much driven by domestic policy. We expect to see the emerging market growth is going to stabilize in the next few months. Things are looks much better now. And particularly for the people in this room, in the trading floors, I'm sure you feel much, much better than the economists in this room. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm an economist. So I may have a different views from the people in the trading floors. Yes, the things look really better, but I will say the third issue, the risk, still on downside. In Europe, the financial market is still very fragile. Because the rollover 
for the sovereign debts and the banking side of the liabilities, uh, up to this year, it's 2.1 trillion. There's no room for any mistake, any slippery in the market. Yes, the liquidity is easing. Yet, the whole thing is not out of picture yet. We need it further to put the firewalls in the place. That's the reason permanent masses, we ask for the extra money to build a firewall to protect the whole world from the foreseeable challenges. And there are many things that Europe needs to do. Capitalize the banking system is absolutely important to prevent the further, de uh, further the right up of, of bad assets are also deleveraging. And to further integrate the regions and make the region work more, much more closer. And of course, in the last, the most important issue is the policy to promote the growth, the structural reform. Not only the labor market reform, but also the macro policy to promote, promote economic growth. Because we see for medium term, Europe still will have a very much GDP growth rates. And this year so far, they probably still undermine recessions. So there's a lot of things for Europeans to do. I would say yes, they have done a fantastic job, particularly since last October. They're working hard to get things done, and much better today, but more need to be done. In states, yes, the data looks much, much better. Give people a lot, a lot of confidence. But there are a few things. The most important issue is on the supply side. In the US, we're still looking for the weeks of recovery ever compared with any crisis we experienced before. The supply side didn't change very much. All the recovery today is led by demand side. We don't see very much merger and acquisition happen in the past. The pattern application is even lower compared with any crisis before. And the labor productivity increase is lower than any crisis we experienced compared to the same periods before. Then the demand side. It's not at all clear whether US household will become the main drive force to getting the demand. Because the households are very carefully to balance to deleveraging their balance sheets, because obviously they still have high debts. They need to push the saving, it's obviously, and will reduce the consumption as well. On demand side, the tax policy is another big issue. The government plan to have a fiscal consolidation 1.3% of GDP for this year, 1.7% uh, fiscal consolidation for next year, and a plus the Bush tax expirations. So add them together, the tax drugs will be 3% of GDP next year. So you absolutely need a medium term credible fiscal policy and the long term plans to make sure the whole economy will smoothly transfer into the sustainable growth path. There are a lot of things need to be done. In the emerging market, the good news is emerging market really working hard to put the policy against the foreseeable challenges they saw, I think, since last October, the things have slowed down. But real impact from slowing down of a European economies is not around this end yet. The real de deleveraging process from financial sector is not around in this end. Yet. Obviously, there's a fundamental challenge for emerging market to carefully manage inflationary pressures and to carefully change the growth model. So there's still medium term and long term challenge as well. So I would say overall, the risk is still on downsides. Things are getting better, but there's no room for optimism. But reform, 
and the further global cooperations. The second thing I would like to mention is the deleveraging. Why the recovery is so difficult this time? I think because we're not in a classical business cycle. We're not in the classical financial crisis. This is not an interesting driven cycle. It's a deleveraging process because the debt is way so hard. If you add the household debt, you add the corporate debt, you add the financial sector debt, and then you add the government debt, the total aggregate debt, in particular advanced economy, varies from 300% of GDP to 600% of GDP. The debts have to be in line with your income. In the past decades, the whole world accumulated too much debt. But it's not easy to get this debt rewired. This is the main challenge. The first issue is, if a household adjusts their balances, they increase the saving, reduce the consumption, which is negative news for growth. The corporate adjusts their balances, they don't invest, which is bad news for growth. The banking sector rebalancing, so they're shrinking their balances, they don't lend, which is bad news. The government cuts their fiscal expenditures to cutting their debts. They don't room for fiscal stimulus, which is bad news for growth too. It's a very difficult, the first point is, to have a strong growth in a deleveraging environment. They don't have very much room. This is exactly the current the challenge and situation we're facing today. When you're very careful to manage it's a process. The process just started. There are trillions of dollars needed to be deleveraging in the banking sector, for example. The classical way to dealing with deleveraging is you do the austerity policy programs, we observe that. The restructuring, we observe that, but not very much. And the monetization, we also observe that. But it's going to be a long and a bumping process. Because we need to be very careful, the first issue, to avoid the household balances move into, and the corporate move into the banking balances, and the banking balances move into the government balances, and the government balances move into the central bank balances. We've got to be very careful for that. We've got to be very careful when we deleverage on the liability side. We want to make sure, because on the balances, you have asset sides. You want to make sure assets are not crashed, too big, too dramatic, and it caused the whole system collapse, which is also not easy. We don't have very much experience. The only thing we had so far is the Japanese experience, which is not necessarily being a, a good story we want to learn. So this is a, a rather long-term process. It's a very complicated. It's not an easy process. We need to pay a lot of attention. But we have to get these things out. Because the debts have to be in line with the income. The third point I would mention is access to liquidity. The most amazing thing we are facing today for the whole world is there's two things that happen at the same time. One end is over liquidity, a lot of liquidity in the system because central banks all double their balances, right? 
The G4 Central Bank will have their balances up to 6.3 and 6.4 trillion dollars. And not only for the G4s, or the emerging market, if you're looking for the BRIC countries, they also boost their central bank balance. For example, the China central bank balance is from 40% of GDP a few years ago, now 80% of GDP. India, 15 to 25% of GDP. Russian, 20 to 32% of GDP. And Brazil, from 18% of GDP a few years ago. Today, it's 32% of GDP of balances. So the main central bank really doubled their balances now. But meanwhile, you see the credit constraint on the other end. It is a very difficult and a challenger the time because it's access to the liquidity to push the, the interest rates really close to zeros. We are in the ever low interest rates, access liquidity situation in world financial and economic history, and even bigger and the theories than 2007. What does that mean? When the risk-free real interest rates are lower, people tend to borrow to invest. That's what we observed before the 2008. But we need a deleveraging at this point. It's really posed a dilemma to the market. But I have, the first of all, I said before, before say anything further, I have to say the monetary policy easing and providing liquidity to the market for these particular moments is a good thing because if you have no fiscal space, the monetary policy is the only instrument you have. It's good for growth. It really works. In the past three and a half years, we observed three different fees phase of a monetary easing phase. For example, from April 2009, roughly to the, 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 the January, February 2010, and roughly to the October, November 2010, to the 11 April, then start October forward. So it's a three different trends of a QE now we observe in the past. Just a pure, pure observations. In these three phases, when you do the QE, it's really facilitated growth. It's a facility of growth of 1.5 percentage of GDPs for advanced economy, 3 percent of the GDP for emerging market. It's a help to push the equity market, 10 percent high for the advanced economy, 20 percent high for emerging market as well, and it pushes down the credit spreads and the banking funding costs, roughly half percentage of a point, and it pushes the capital moving across the board. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is, if you're looking for the interval, when there's no queue happening in the three seasons, there's two intervals, in fact, you will see growth, growth becomes slower, and the market gets back, and the funding costs are getting up again. So money policy does have a very effective way to influence the market. So we've got to be very careful as well. The monetary easy is the only instruments we have today in the hands. It's playing, and it will continue to play an important role. But we've got to be very careful to think about how do we unwind the whole process later. We have to think about when the real risk-free real interest rates is so low, what market will behave? What the expectation will change accordingly? That's the key issues we learn. Because the key issues is not the money, how much is it going to the real economy trimming down, or the really moving between the balances. It's really how much is changing your guys' expectations. And we do do see the, the positive and the policy to move back and forth in terms of impact on the market. So we've got to be very careful, and which also have impact on the global capital flow as well. So this is uh, another big issue. And we've got to be very careful to watch the inflation as well. 
in the US, the inflation is really out of the bottom of the cycle now. And in the emerging market, the labor costs increase, the land costs increase, the commodity costs increase, the energy costs increase as well. So there are supply side effects, there are demand side effects. So we also with this ample liquidity, we need to be very careful to watch the inflationary pressures as well, as a macro policy as well. So the fourth point I would like to mention is enhance or further global economic interconnectedness. We all talk about globalization. It's become the main thing of our life. But the whole thing changes. We did some very interesting studies. We found that in the past 15, 20 years, the world really changes in terms of interconnectedness. Obviously, the world is much interconnected than ever before today because the trade flow increasing 10 years horizon with, with the, the, the connective, not the volume, in more than 70%, and the financial sector increased to 75% as well. But more than that, with the study simulations, we found the world today becomes three big groups. The one big group is the advanced economy. They are so close to each other. You will argue with me, advanced economy always close to together. No, which is not the case. 10 years ago even, in Europe, there are two centers, North Center and the South Center. So it's a French Italy Benny cycle of interconnectedness, and German Holland uh, uh, and all the other countries moving together. In the 10 years of Europe, we see these two centers merge and become one center. It's absolutely amazing. And today, the whole advanced economy, including America, US, all of them together become the one center. The second move is the oil group. The oil group today becomes second big cluster now. This is good together, not defined by geo geo geographical sense. It's all your Saudi and the Russians, Kazakhstan, and all those countries getting together, they become the group. They share the same business cycle. They share a lot of what I call the co-movements of the policy instruments. The most interesting and exciting happened in this region. We observe a very general new Asian cluster is forming. It's absolutely amazing we found that Brazil is a part of the Asian group. It's absolutely amazing we found Chile is a part of the Asian group. It's absolutely amazing we found South Africa is a part of the Asian group. And even like Tanzania and a few other countries, it's a very big groups with the vertical supply chain and grouping together. It's a new, really a region forming now. Once again, let me emphasize, it's not a geographic sense, but sense in the business cycle and economic and financial interconnectedness. What does that mean? It means a few things. Obviously, for example, in the Asia, the vertical supply chains for me is very good because efficiency improve is very much. But the risks also can be increased as well. That's the reason we see when the earthquake in Japan, when the flood in Thailand will have an impact on the whole supply chain. We see co-movements of a policy instruments within the clusters, which is in the good sense, is good because people take more and more close policy, but this co-movement create, if not in the proper way, can create an even big challenge as well. We see the interconnect, or let me not use this word, we see the 
the correlations between the market increase dramatically. Across the regions, for example, Asia and the US and the Europe, particularly, for example, I think I don't need to mention that, but most amazing things, the correlation in the stock market movements between the Latin America and Asia increased from roughly 35% to 80%. They almost move more or less parallel now today. And the correlation increased dramatically across different asset classes. You observe the completely different things. The currency market will move with the equity market. The credit market will can move with the bonds market. So many things we don't see the correlation before today, they move together. The whole world is much more closer than ever we can imagine. imagine. Improved efficiency, that's true. But also show the move in the same direction at the same time, which also was a lot of cautious as well. I see two watches here. One watch tell me I still have 22 minutes left. Another watch tell me I still have 55 minutes left. <laughs> which one is the Swiss time? This one? I saw that it's a Hong Kong time. <laughs> OK. So I think I probably should stop here. I guess I eat up with 15.5. Or exactly, it's a 20, 22 minutes and 30 seconds. I use half of my time. I should stop here to open the floor. But let me sum up. I would say, if I can sum up what I, what I observe for the world today, I would say the risk, global growth rate is slowing down. Given the deleveraging process, we probably will see quite some times with a moderated growth. Things are getting better. The market is still very fragile. We need to very careful use this window opportunity to further promote the reform. And the risk still on downside. So there are few trends as are defined because the deleveraging process because excess liquidity, because ever interconnected as we observe today, and we live together in this world, we're facing daunting challenger as well. I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who will chair the q and Me or you? Oh, I saw the lady will chair the q and <laughs> So we, we have time for a few questions. Um, any any question? They're back there. Can you get a mic here? I can hear the sounds, but I cannot see the person. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jennifer Chang from The Financialist. Um, I have a question regarding your, your interconnected, uh, interconnectedness of the global economy. Uh, last week, Zhou Xiaochuan, the governor of China's central bank, uh, actually uh, he warned the unstable global economy, and in particular, the European debt crisis could hamper China's economic growth. Uh, also, uh, do you think the uh, European debt crisis would be a serious <coughs> problem for the emerging economies, especially we know that uh, most of them are export-driven? Thank you. Okay, should I take a few questions or answer one by Up one? To Up to you. Up to me. Why not we take a few? So that give me some, some, some free space to, to try to maneuver a little bit of yeah, that. In the front here. <laughs> yeah, you know my truck. <laughs> Peter, please. Um, Peter Kwong from Alpha Group Holding. Um, just a quick question in terms of, you mentioned about um, the US being deleveraging. Um, obviously the, Dow, the S P and Dow Jones has been going out for three months now. My question is, um, uh, with the election, how sustainable this current trend is gonna, is gonna be? Uh, do we see that you know, we are moving up to a point where uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> corrections or major corrections is, is uh, up on the cards, or do you, how sustainable do you, do you see this trend is? Thank you. 
Well, Peter, let me start with you. I'm very uh, uh, sorry to say you, you claim you, you are a long-time friend of mine, but you did not listen carefully to me. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, the stock market really getting back and uh, also strongly because it's ample liquidity. And uh, which is good news, because if you're looking for the U.S., uh, the household, the, the, the wealth, it's going to help the wealth getting back. But it also could be risky, because when your wealth come back, you feel less pressures to deleveraging. Because you, you, your wealth income, you, but because the, the key issue is the net wealth and net debts. People usually compare with the growth. Um, how this, the, the equity market rebounds will be sustainable, I would say it's, it's, it's very much to see how this, uh, the GDP growth is and a few other things. And at this moment, I say the risk is still on downsides because the U.S. is still facing a very challenger, the fiscal drives, and particularly for next year, and also the supply ch side change is very important because in any crisis, the really things that pulls out the e economy out of the crisis is supply side change. And in that case, we didn't see it happen today because all the things that happen in this crisis is driven by demand side. So until we see the supply side change, and I think it will be difficult to see we're out of the world. And the US is still under 3% of the GDP gap. There's a lot of room to go. Yeah, things are getting better. Yeah, I think this is very true. And the US economy is doing, doing much better, but the risk is still on downside. So we'll, we've got to be very careful. Even the growth getting stronger, but we still have to see the risks behind. I think that's the whole thing. Um, for the European crisis impact on the China and on, on Asia, I would say the first issue is that uh, uh, the things are looking better. You know, it's very much uh, in some way uh, stabilized, but uh, still very fragile. Um, so we've got to be very careful. Because the few things, Europeans still the major uh, the, 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 the destination for China, the, for Asians' exports. This is very important. If you have very weak growth, you will see the, the exports will, will, will drop. In fact, the export of growth to Europe from the region has dropped almost to zero. And uh, which really uh, 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 reflect the importance of uh, European growth to Asia. The second issue is the banking deleveraging. European banks hold a lot of international exposures. They are the largest international financial in institutes. They account for fifty percent of global trade financing. But given the balances, given the capital requirements, and, and given the, the, the assets repricing, they have to think their balances. So they obviously will have an impact on the loan growth in the region. We observe the trade financing has really dropped in the past few months. We observe European banking selling dollars denominated assets. We observe European banks also try to cut in their syndication loans for example, to shipping industry and aviation and a few other things, which will have direct impact on, on the regional growth because the loan is very much important to promote the growth. And we observe in the past few months that some foreign bank and local bank try to come up the gap because of the leave of European banks, but still not enough. So I think the European banks were further deleveraging so the China and the region need to prepare for that. But for China, it's a special case because the foreign exposure, the loan exposure to China is very small, but it's relevant for the whole, 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 whole group. But the European banks, also financial institutions and other banks are a major carrier of a dollar funding for the region. This is a big issue. When, when I say they're major carriers, they own the dollar, although it's the dollar. So with the deleveraging leveraging process, they have to pull the money go back which the real issue we observed since September last year, the capital market volatilities, because it's really money goes back and then money back. So there, 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 there are a few things, that the, the real impact from trade through the trade channel, through the banking channel, through the equity and the currency market, 
and uh, so the financial institutes. And also, the last but not the least, is a confident channel. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is, uh, is play more and more important roles in those days. Yeah, any other questions? Yes, please. I would be very surprised if there's no question. That means you guys are fully convinced by me. Yeah. Uh, ben Ai from Principal Global Investors. Uh, the question is, uh, how would you define hard landing in China? Is it six, seven, eight, what is it? <laughs> I guess you are the cons, huh? <laughs> so you always numbers everything. Uh, but not this ends. I would say the first issue is I, I would say China is having a soft landing. And uh, land quite OK. Because uh, the inflation rate is really down now. In the past few months, 2.3. And the growth is slowing down. And investment is slowing down, which is very good. And now the concerns of whether it's a slow is too much. So I don't know how, how do you define hard landing. You define hard landings is uh, too little or too much. So the number will be a big interval. But then I would say the whole policy and the whole uh, trends towards the soft landing and, uh, at this moment. The first two, two months, the number was weak. Because the, the consumption growth is net is 11.4%, so still weak. But the investment growth is still strong, 21%. So in that sense, I would say overall China is heading for the soft landing. And we need to very careful to balance too much and too little, uh, which obviously is not an easy thing to do. But real concerns in China is because the inflationary pressure is a long-term issue for China. So China needs to always keep in mind that's a, one of the main challenges they're facing. And the investment ratio is always too high. 47.8% of GDP as investments is way too high, given the lower growth GDP uh, of the world as a background. So China needs to carefully manage slowing down the investments, but not bumping too much on the growth in the smooth way, which is not easy. So what China, uh, if I describe China, what China, Chinese economy need to, actually, I would say Chinese economy is soft landing now, it's good, but need to continue to soft landing, soft landing, soft landing, until finally, softly landed. <laughs> Job is not over yet. Yes, please. There's a question at the back. Let's take that first. Oh, he's the boss. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Zumin, um, the uh, head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, um, said on the weekend in Beijing a, a very interesting speech. It included the statement that China needed a stronger and more flexible exchange rate. Now, I just wondered, um, this is obviously becoming a big issue in America at the time of its election campaign. Um, and I think last week a, a senior Chinese official said that the currency had reached equilibrium. I just wonder what your perspective is. Is this really a side issue or is it something that is really at the heart of the transformation of China. I thought this exchange rate always will come out, but never thought in a such a nice way compare me with my boss, Christine Lagarde. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. The first things I have to tell me, yes, I, I'm with uh, IMF. I do not have my China hats. I lost their hats a long time ago. So I live in Washington, but I don't pay American tax. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an international servant. So, and so my view represents the fund view, not the Chinese view. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the first issue, since you mentioned that in a very uh, 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 smart way. Um, I think the good news is that both the Chinese government and us and also American governments agree a flexible exchange rate regime is good for China, it's good for the whole world. The good news is the Chinese government is committed to move into the more flexible exchange rate regime. The good news is 
We observed China's trade surplus dropped roughly from 11.7% in 2007, drops near to 3 and 4%. So things are improving. But what is the level the exchange rates you particularly asked is a proper, or we say, in line with the median term equilibrium level, it's an issue. We're in the process to assess this level, and you probably will see our reports shortly. But I will say the key issue is to keep the exchange rate move into the more flexible regime is more important, because at the end of the day, it's a regime play more important role than level. I'm not sure whether I answered your question. Any question? Yeah. There, was, there was one here. There was a gentleman here. I, um, I, I guess I just wanted to ask, I mean, every, every person and every economist in the world at the moment thinks it's this great idea that China rebalances their economy, less investment, more consumption. Um, I guess my sense is that that's going to take a bit longer than people think. Uh, a lot of financial commentators at the moment seem to think that there's a step function happening this year. I was wondering if, I, if you could comment on how long this kind of process takes. I know it's been something that we've been talking about for a long time, even back as far as 2006 in the first multilateral consultation. I'd, I'd like a sense of how you think it's progressing and how long it's likely to take. Now that's, uh, that's also a very good question uh, regarding about China. Chinese uh, the household consumption level is too low and uh, need the, 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 the increase uh, because it's, it's a very important uh, for Chinese economy because China needs the rebalancing uh, the, the economic model from more export growth, more investment driven growth to more consumption driven growth. I think that's also the consensus among the Chinese leaders and uh, the funds and the many international community uh, as well. Now you ask how soon can move. I would say currently the speed is not too bad because last year they have a 14% consumption growth. China consume, uh, contributed roughly more than one third of a global consumption growth, so which is not too bad. But obviously the base is still small. So the whole thing is we're not trying to quantify the how, how, how much they can go, but we, we really uh, promote the Chinese policy toward this end. There's a lot of things that need to be done. It's not an easy just say, hey, buy more, come to Hong Kong, go shopping. Right. <laughs> you need to build a social security safety net. You need to build a healthcare system. You need to build a better hospital system. You need to build a very important education system as well. You want to make sure the house price is affordable so people will have more money to consume in the other consumer goods rather than investing in the house. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. The good news, we observe China is really particularly since this crisis, working on those issues, put more money in, in the soft uh, uh, areas and education, healthcare, on those areas, and which will help China to, to increase their consumption in the long term. But it's also it's a gradual approach. But the 14% consumption growth rate is not too bad, right? We have to say that. Yeah. Thank you. It's just time for one or two maximum questions. Any other question? There's a question there. Yeah, there are hands here. Oh, it depends on who has a mark. I'll come back to you after that. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chu. I'd like to ask a question about a um, slightly different topic. About four weeks ago, uh, World Bank published a major report on China oh. uh, with the uh, Development Research Center of the State Council called China in 2030, recommending very, some very fundamental and drastic reform in the Chinese economy. Uh, rebalancing, change in the physical system, and uh, privatization of the economy. How do you see um, the urgency of all these re reforms? And do you have confidence that at least some of these reforms, particularly the major ones, will be seriously implemented in China in the next five to 10 years? Now, those uh, recommendations are obviously important. I was, I've got to be very careful before I fell down to that when I talk too excited about China. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, now, I think I agree with you. Those, those recommendations are absolutely important to change the growth model. There are so many things that China needs to do to change the growth model and uh, to build the safety nets and the further reform SOE. You mentioned, you did not, not mention that. 
open the whole service sector. You know, this is, this is absolutely important. Even not mentioning the up value chain of manufacturing and put more emphasis on the food and agriculture. So there's a lot of things China do. And this is always is good for Chinese economy. So I always say Chinese government will carry out these recommendations and will, will move forward because it's good for, 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 for Chinese economy as well. So there's a lot of things China need to move forward because after 30 some years of very strong growth, uh, there's really fundamental structure changes happening you know, in China. Uh, need to move forward. Yeah. This question here. Hey, Dr. Ji, um, in your um, description of the global growth and the interconnectedness, you haven't mentioned about Japan. So I'm not sure if there's any role to be paid by Japan, particularly with regard to its, to its uh, experience in the past two lost decades. So would Europe, or uh, even to less extent US, be following some sort of similar path to Japan? What is your will? Thank you uh, to mention Japan. Uh, this is obviously a very important economy in the world, and Japan is the third largest economy in the world. And uh, uh, Japan suffers from the earthquake in the last year. Um, it's really, unfortunately, a uh, 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 big event. But the whole economy is a recovery. And we observe some very strong growth in the first quarter so far. And we expect to see Japanese will have a positive and a relatively strong growth for this year. Um, I think this uh, uh, is very important, and also government has uh, proposed uh, a, a few package for the infrastructure investments and stimulate the whole economy, try to bring the whole economy back, we think is very good. But there are a few things I think the, the Japanese need to do more. The first, obviously, is the fiscal issues. The debt ratio is way high, and the Japanese have to come a new revenue policies to have a new revenue sources to cover the cost, and, uh, and also need to have a medium to credible fiscal uh, plan to reduce the debt levels, which obviously is not sustainable. And there are also issues is in terms of uh, the tradable sector and the non-tradable sector in Japan. Because in Japan, the tradable, se tradable sector is very productive, doing very well. But non-tradable sector, and because of globalization, still more or less, and within the rich countries. So the non-tradable sector will need to be further uh, open and to enhance the productivity, which is also a big issue in terms of structural reform. Uh, Japan also facing very serious demographic challenges as well. So labor market policy is more macro policy to promote a woman and, and all the, 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 the people join the labor force and to have the policy properly against the demographic change also major challenges. I would say overall, the Japanese are really facing a big challenge in the past year because of earthquake, but they are responsive properly and we expect to see a strong growth this year, but there are fundamental issues they have to deal with. One final question there at the back. There is increasing discussion of financial repression, meaning foreign exchange controls or huge incentives for the banks and other investors, uh, institutions to put their money into sovereign debt rather than making loans. Can you comment on this as a trend and the dangers of it? I think it's your job. Because <laughs> you're in the market, you know much better than I do. <laughs> right? I'm just a poor macroeconomist. And uh, you see, very interesting, people in the floor, in the trade floors, is much more happy than people as economists, as I said. Economists tend to tell you, if you when U.S. said the long-term interest rate in the next three years to be zero, it's a, it's, a, it's a signal for a very challenging time ahead. And the people in the trade floor see a lot of activities, markets getting better, so they're very happy. It's absolutely amazing to these two things can coexist together. 
And uh, obviously, I guess, undermines your concerns with the issue people talk a lot in those days, is sales in May. It's happened in the past a few times. We're not in the position, unfortunately, it comes on the stock market. Well, particularly, we will not do that. But I will say, it's excess ample liquidity where lower risk-free interest rates create a lot of risk and challenge for the whole society. The capital move really in and out in a pretty dramatic way, which we observed particularly since August of last year. And the pattern, this pattern probably will continue. So you gotta be very careful. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's the, the thing um, we observe, so we say we'll see We'll see a bumping road ahead. We'll see a moderate GDP growth rate. We see the financial market still fragile. But we'll see a lot, a lot of volatilities. If I can stop here, it's exactly zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.